Genesis chapter 22, Genesis chapter 22, verse 1, and it reads, it says this, Now it came to pass, after these things, that God tested Abraham. Don't get it twisted. God loves you, but he will test you. He will test you. So then he tested him and said to Abraham, Abraham, he said, here I am. Then he said, take now your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, which I shall tell you. Say what now? God asked Abraham to take the only son he had and to kill him. You know, some people will lie to you and say, everything God does makes sense. That's a lie. <laughs> I don't know about your journey with God, but my journey with God, most of the stuff he does makes no sense. It's like, what are you up to? He said this. So Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of the men with him and Isaac, his son, and split the wood for the burnt offering and rose and went to the place which the Lord had told him. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said to the man, stay here with the donkey. The lad and I will go yonder, watch this, and worship. Was he going to worship? No. He was going to kill his son. But Abraham understood something that we need to understand, that worship is not a song. We sing a song to worship, but worship is not a song. Worship is a life surrendered to God. Obedience is my greatest worship. The Bible says obedience is better than sacrifice. God said, actually, stop singing that song. Go do what I told you to do. He said, we're going to go yonder and worship, and we will come back to you. So Abraham took the wood, the burnt offering, and laid it on Isaac, his son. And he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and the two of them went together. But Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, my father. He said, here I am, my son. Then he said, look, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Somebody say, that's a good question. That's a good question. That's a good question. If your dad is going up to make a sacrifice and you see wood, you see fire, you see a knife, you don't see no lamb, you should be worried. He said, Dad, where is the lamb? Abraham said, my, God, my son, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. So the two of them went together. I've got a message entitled for you today, Let It Die. Just, just elbow your neighbor and say, let it die, let it die, let it die, let it, let it die. Father God, we're grateful. God, we're thankful. God, you said that you inhabit the praises of your people. Your word said, lift up your head, O ye gates, that the king of glory may come in. So, God, in this moment, we welcome you in. God, we need you. We need you to heal. We need you to deliver. We need you to download supernatural ideas. God, we need you to take us one step closer to the plan, the purpose, the destiny that you have for us. And we will be ever so careful to give you all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise. In the matchless name of Jesus, we pray. Come on, can you shout amen? Can you... That was a whisper. Can you shout amen? Y'all ready to go on a journey? I have, I, have, I have three children. That's why I pray so much that God would help me not to take their life. I've got three children. They're all bad children. They're all bad children. They're all, they just like their mama. They just, they just, just. I was just telling my five-year-old recently, boy, I will make you disappear and make another one just like you, and they will never. <laughs> I'm actually excited because I'm in Charlotte and my children are in Maryland, which means I had the best sleep last night I have had in a long time. I, I, I love my kids. They are the joy of my life. And if you're a parent here, you know one of your missions as a parent is to not mess your kids up the way that your parents <laughs> mess you up. And I know my dad is sitting on the front row, 
but I said what I said. <laughs> my goal is not to put my kids through the trauma that I think I was put through. <laughs> Love you, Dad. And I've been doing well so far, I think. But my kids recently asked for something, and it triggered the unhealed trauma on the inside of me. Hear me. I'm loving God. I'm walking in the Holy Ghost. But there's still some stuff inside. Anybody can testify. I know. There's just still some stuff in there that God is working out. Don't be mad at me. I'm not who I used to be. I've come a long way, but I'm not quite yet who I need to be. There, there's still some things that he's working on the inside side of me. My children said, Daddy, we want to fish. And they had no idea. They thought that this was just a normal request. Daddy, we want to fish. But what they do not know is there is trauma in my life from my childhood connected to having a pet fish. And I said, guys, anything but a fish. I bought them a dog so we don't have to have a fish. How many people know that don't make no sense? A dog is a lot more work than a fish. But that's just how much I don't want to deal with fish because growing up, I had a pet fish. I loved my pet fish. My pet fish's name was Finny, Finny, Finny. Before there was Finding Nemo, there was Finny. Finny was this little decrepit goldfish with a broken flipper. It, it, it was a busted fish, but I loved my fish. I, I won my fish where most people win their fish at the state fair. You, you shoot the ball in the hoop, and they give you a fish in a little plastic bag. You should know nothing valuable comes in a plastic bag. You, 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 you sh you're in trouble from the second that you get it, but I loved my fish. I had my plastic bag and carried it to the car. We stopped at PetSmart on the way home. I, I bought a glass jar for my fish. I got the little rocks for the bottom of it. I even got the little scuba man so that my fish finny could have a friend in his tank. And we went home and put it on the kitchen counter and I poured all the water and finny into the tank and finny just kind of laid on his side. And I'm like, oh no, is finny dead? But then he came alive and I'm like, yes. And, and I, I said goodnight to finny that night. I was so proud. I had my little fish. I was probably like eight, nine years old. You couldn't tell me nothing about my fish finny. I woke up the next morning morning, not because the sun was up, not to the alarm clock. I woke up to the blood-curdling scream of my mother. I come running downstairs. I'm like, Mom, what happened? And I see my mother with a spatula. You know the things that you flip pancakes with? I see her with the spatula in her hand, and she's just there. I said, what's wrong? She said, nothing, nothing, nothing at all. I run over to my fish, and Finney's in the tank. He's swimming. He looks fine. I don't know why she screamed, but I said, okay. I went on about my business. I went to sleep the next night, woke up the next morning the same way. Mom screamed, and I run downstairs, same scene. She has a spatula in her hand, but Finney's in the tank. I later found out that I had won a suicidal fish. That for some reason, Finney thought it was better not to live than to be taken care of by this eight-year-old kid who keeps on wanting to hug Finney. So Finney said, I'm going to jump to my demise. So every morning, he would jump out of the tank and flop on the ground. But I think he wanted to traumatize my mother because he wouldn't drop out at 1 a.m. He wouldn't jump out at 3 a.m. He wouldn't jump out at 5 a.m. Every morning, he would jump out at 10 before 7 because he knew she was coming coming down at seven, and he wanted her to see him flopping and gasping for air. And the spatula, was she saying, I'm not touching that nasty fish. She was scooping up, drop it back in the tank, and hope that he came back to life. After about seven days of this, I came downstairs. There was no more spatula. There was just a paper towel folded up. I think she killed the fish, y'all. I ain't gonna lie to you. I, th I just, I think she just had enough of it. I think she picked it up one day, gave it one little squeeze. But all I know is we had a funeral for Finney. I am not joking. We had a funeral for Finney. We all, whole family, me and my siblings, we stood around that toilet, <laughs> sang "Amazing Grace." 
And then there was one last flush that sent Finney on to heaven. And I just, I can't deal with fish after that moment. Now my kids are asking me for it. I'm like, no, nah, I can't go through the trauma of seeing something that I love die. Pastor Brian said that you guys are in a series called After Death, talking about the resurrection of God. He is the resurrection and life. He said, I've been preaching about Lazarus, and I've been, you know how he talks. I've been preaching. Get his lips going the way he do. I've been preaching about J. Irish's daughter. <laughs> Please don't tell him I did that. He said, I've been preaching about the resurrection. He said, if you preach anything about the resurrection, it'll be right within our series. I said, I got you, man. So I came down to preach about let it. Somebody said, that ain't the resurrection. That ain't the resurrection. Listen, I flew all the way from Maryland to let you know there's some things in your life that you are trying to keep alive. And God sent me to let you know, let it it die. Have you ever felt like you've got something and it keeps jumping out of the tank and you find it gasping on the ground for air and you keep resuscitating it and you're like, why am I keeping this alive? And God said, let it die. You ever felt like you were trying to keep a friendship alive? Come on now. Y'all used to be tight. But that was college. Maybe you started your job on the same day and y'all just connected and you clicked and, and you were just doing life, maybe doing life three years, five years. Maybe it was a middle school friend, 15 years. But for some reason, you kept growing. And I'm not saying they didn't. I'm just saying you did. Yeah, you ever talking to somebody and you realize we ain't got nothing in common? And we used to have something in common. And now they just talk and talk, and you're just like. And then they're like, you know what I'm talking about? And you're like. And, and you, you know the ship has sailed on this one. But you're, you're trying to keep. What irritates me are the people who never call you. When you call them. They're like, nobody ever's here for me. Nobody ever has my bag. Well, you ain't called nobody. Maybe if you let it die. You, you, you ever had a side business you were trying to keep alive? I, I did, by the way, I'm warning y'all. This ain't going to be a mess. Y'all going to be shouting a lot of amens too. Y'all going to, y'all going to, no, 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 I think it's going to live. This is going to make me a million dollars. Yeah, right now it's costing you. And you're like, no, it's going to work, it's going to work, it's going to work, let it. Anybody ever have some family traditions that you're keeping alive? And it's like, ain't nobody else in your family. Listen, Thanksgiving is always at your house. You always do all the cooking. They always show up late. They never wash any of the dishes, and they got the nerve to take leftovers. There are certain things in our life that are dying, and we are the only ones keeping them alive. And here's what I've discovered, because I've been there before without even realizing it. First, we get frustrated other people that they're not helping us keep the relationship alive or keep our finances alive or whatever it may be. And then without even realizing it, and we can't say this because we're in church even though we feel it, but sometimes we get mad at God, of God, why aren't you keeping this alive? It's one thing to have something in your life that is dying. It's one thing in your life to say, God, why are you not keeping this alive? It is a completely different story. When it's not dying, God's telling you to kill it. What do I do when God is asking me to lay down something? that I don't want to lay down. Elbow your neighbor say, this is grad school. Come on, tell somebody, this is, this is, this is, this, this is grad school. This is, this is, we're not, we're not, we're not, we're not, we're not talking about now I lay me down to sleep. I pray to the Lord my soul to keep it. <laughs> this is, this, no, we, 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 we going to grow up as Christians just a little bit. 
Listen, God does a lot of great things for us. Somebody say amen. God moves supernaturally in our lives. He said, if I did not spare my only son Jesus, how much will I not more so give you all things? The Bible says, forget not the benefits of the Lord. God will bless you. Somebody say amen. But the same God that will bless you will also ask you to kill some things in your life. He came to Abraham and he said, Abraham, I need you to take your son, your only son, and sacrifice him as an act of worship. Now, if you do not know God's word or you're not familiar with this story, you may not catch how significant this request is. You've got to understand, first of all, this was not just Abraham's son. This was not just Abraham's only son. This was the son that Abraham waited over 25 years to have. You see, Abraham and his wife Sarah were wealthy people. They were influential people. Everybody in their country knew that the favor of God was on their life, except they were unable to have children. There's a passage in Genesis chapter 15 where Abraham is having a conversation with God, and he says, what's, you, what's the use of having all of this if I've got no heir, I've got no son to leave it all to? God says, hear me, you will have a son. Matter of fact, I'm going to change your name from Abram, which means father, to Abraham, which means father of many nations. He said, look at the stars. You're going to have so many descendants, you will not be able to count how many kids you have based on how many stars are in the sky. God says, you're going to have your son. And you know what happened after God said he was going to have his son? Twenty. Five years went by, and no son. Now, y'all are a lot more saved than I am. So y'all just know, he'll, he, he may not come when you want him, but he's always on time. <laughs> I'm not that saved. If God gives me a promise, 25 minutes <laughs> later, I'm like, all right, God, where is it? And then I start throwing his Bible back into his face. You're not like, man, you can't lie. If you said it, you've got to do it. And God said, read the whole book. Because there's another verse in the Bible that says, as long as the earth remains, there will be seed, time, and harvest. I don't like that, so I just take out time. And I said, seed, harvest. God said, you don't got to read it, but it's still in there. The way God moves in your life is seed, time, and harvest. Hear me. Some of you think that God's forgotten about you. Some of you think that God's abandoned you. Some of you think that God has not been faithful to what he promised you. And what you re don't realize is you are in the time season of your miracle. That he said it, that's the seed. But there's a season where you have to wait. The Bible, it's the word kairos. It's for the divine time of God to come to pass. Abraham, like many of us, he thought that God forgot. And he said, hey, let me help God out. Because clearly he don't know how to do this child making thing. So he gets with his wife, Sarah, and Sarah, please don't hate me, but they must have been from North Carolina, because that was some North Carolina stuff. We don't do that up in Maryland. But his wife got him a side chick. That's some down south type. <laughs> they ain't going to invite me back, Justin. I'm going to show. His wife suggested a side. Now, some dude is like, I like the Bible. I like the Bible. This is, don't worry. God killed him too, so don't do that. Anyway. So he went and had a child, Ishmael, with his servant, Hagar, trying to help God make the miracle come to pass. Can I help you out? Never help God. The only thing you're going to do trying to help God is make matters worse. Hey, married folks, can I help you out? Never help God. You know how we try to help God? Oh, my spouse isn't here from the Holy Spirit. Let me tell him what God is saying. Don't do that. He could talk for himself. No, no, no. You, you're just going to make it worse. So they went and they had this child, Ishmael. Now notice when God said, sacrifice your son Isaac, he said, your only son. And then God said, I ain't acknowledging that foolishness. That ain't got nothing to do with me. Let's just, can, can we talk world, world events for a second? You know all this drama that's going on in Israel right now and Gaza and Palestine and all that and let there be peace in the Middle East. Do you know what that really is? That is Abraham's illegitimate son at war with Abraham's legitimate son. 
Israel and the Palestinians are the descendants of Isaac and Ishmael. Here's how bad Abraham messed up. His mess up 4,000 years later is still causing drama on earth because he tried to intersect what God was doing. After all that foolishness, after 25 years, God still gave him a son. Because what we don't understand about God is even when you're faithless, he is faithful. He said, I am faithful to every word and every promise that I have spoken. If I said it, I will do it. It will not return void. Somebody needs to hear this. You think you've messed up too badly for God to move supernaturally in your life. And hear me, his love for you is not based on your performance. His love for you is based on that you were made in his image. So here is Abraham finally having his son with Sarah, their, God, their miracle, their promise. And that boy grows from two to four and four to six, eight, nine, ten, twelve. And then God comes to Abraham and he says, hey, you know that miracle? You know that promise? You know that thing that you waited for 25 years? I'm asking you to kill it. Now, here's what you've got to understand about the Bible. Not everything in this book makes sense. And if it's all got to make sense to you at first glance, you're going to miss what God is doing. Not all of life makes sense. And in those seasons where we're like, God, what are you doing? What is going on? We've got to remind ourselves that all things work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose. And if it doesn't make sense, God must be working. Just, just, just touch your neighbor. I know they're tired of getting elbow. Just touch him and say, let him work. 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 Oh, I'm sorry. I'm getting old, y'all. The young folks, they, they told me it's, it's let him cook. Is that the, is that the phrase? It, it's it, let, him, let, him, let him cook. Let him cook. Come on. Any cooks in the room? Any cooks in the room? Now, now, now this is just, you know, everybody just, I'm a cook. I don't believe you, okay? If you read a recipe, you are not a cook. You are a reader. There is a difference between a reader and a cook. Here's the actual test of whether you're a cook or not. If you've got teaspoons and tablespoons in your house, you ain't nobody's cook. That ain't cooking. Real cooking is a dash of this and a sprinkle of that. If you know what a dash is, you're a cook. And if you ever come in the kitchen when the cook is cooking and you got the nerve to try to taste something, you finna get smacked. Hear me. Don't touch nothing. Don't taste nothing. I'm not done. And then I used to get so mad because I go to my mom, I'm hungry, I'm hungry. Can I have a snack? And she's like, no, you're going to mess up your, it'll be ready when it's ready. Some of us are pestering God. God, it don't make sense. God, it don't make sense. God, why am I married yet? God, why hasn't my business taken off yet? God, why, God, why? And he's like, let me cook. I'm up to something. And it may not make sense right now, but you're going to be grateful in the end. First thing is this. Write this down. Write this down. Write this down. Some things were meant to die. Some things, something. Oh, hey, y'all. Pastor Brian's coming back next week, okay? He's coming back next week. You're going to be encouraged. You're going to be full. Woo! Next week's going to be, but you got me today. Next week, we're going to celebrate the resurrection. But in order to have a resurrection, you first got to have a death. Some things were meant to die. I am ignorant. I'm not saying that God is ignorant. I'm ignorant. I'm a pastor's kid. We're filled with the Holy Ghost, but we're also a little cynical, a little sarcastic. So when I read God's word, I always see ignorance in God's word. I don't know if there's a more ignorant statement or verse in the Bible than Joshua chapter 1, verse 1. Here's what it says. It says, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord... It came to pass that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, get up, go over this Jordan, you and all the people, to the land which I am giving you. You're like, what's so ignorant about that? What's so ignorant about that is God could have taken Moses in. God could have taken the people in, but God says, nope, you're going to die on this side. And he just waited until that generation and Moses, and as soon as Moses died, God came to, he probably interrupted the funeral. As I know y'all here crying and all that kind of stuff, don't worry, Moses up in heaven with me, he good, but it's time to move because the right thing has died. 
So now you can step into what I have for you. Hear me. Some of you have not stepped into the promise that God has for you because you're holding on to a relationship that God has already told you that needs to die. You can't take that person where you're going. And you're just like, no, no, no. And he says, that's cool. I'll wait. But you can't go into what I have for you until you let go of some stuff that are not allowed to go with you. Hear me, anything that has died in your life, anybody that has stepped out of your life was not critical for the destiny that God had for you. Matter of fact, God knew that that thing, that mindset, that person had the potential to cause you to forfeit your destiny. So he said, where you're going, you can't take that with you. I... I I, I almost live at airports right now. I fly a lot. I was in the Bronx yesterday and flew down here. And was in Maryland the day before and just kind of with pastoring and preaching and all that kind of stuff. And, and if, you, if you fly a lot, you kind of get your rhythm and you get your schedule of here's how I do this travel thing. You, you can tell rookies at an airport because they get to the airport two hours before the flight. Why are you there that early? Ain't nothing to do. I'm not getting there two hours before the flight. I'm getting there an hour before the flight. Well, you're not going to be able to check your bags. I don't got no bags to check because everybody knows. I don't know how it is down in Charlotte. Up in Maryland, you check a bag, you fit never see that bag again. I'm, I'm not. There's no way I'm giving these people my bag. If I can't carry it on the plane, I'm not bringing it. Matter of fact, I don't even like to fly until I've had a nice brisk run through the airport. I just, I just like to get my heart rate up, the wind blowing through my hair. I don't even get on the plane until I hear, Stephen Chandler, this is the last call. We are closing the gate in two minutes and I put my food down because I'm at Chick-fil-A chilling and I'm like now's the time to take off running <laughs> and I ain't never missed a flight so it's working so I get to the airport about an hour before and listen if you're going to do this you can't play once you get there you get there late, but you've got to be intentional once you get there. So I'll jump out the car. I got my bag, and I'm walking. I got TSA. I got clear. I got everything that can get me through quickly. I go through the line, and then I come up to this person, <laughs> this creation of God. And I know it's a big church, and I know people work all different type of places. So if you're watching or if you're an overflow in the room and you work for TSA, you need to know that we love you. We just don't like you. And I don't know what the training manual is. There's a training manual say you're not allowed to smile. You're not allowed to respond. I've been I've be walking up, hey, how's your day going? They're like, mm. And I'll hand them my ID and they'll, they'll put it in the little, the little reader deal. And then you're just waiting for the bing. <laughs> like, thank you, you go around. I don't know, y'all, I got the worst luck in the world. Every time I get in line to go put my stuff through the scanner, there's always somebody in front of me that does not know what they're doing. <laughs> it's not that complicated. Put your stuff on the belt. Get out my way. Just go through. They're here taking one shoe off and the other shoe off and taking their laptop out of their, it's TSA pre-check. We actually did a little interview so we don't got to take our shoes off. Get through that thing. So I'm sitting there. You know I'm a pastor, so I'm supposed to act all godly and all that. I'm like, let's go, let's go, let's go. And I put my stuff in there. And I don't, yo, I think it's God trying to teach me patience, and I ain't learned a lesson yet. Every time I walk through that thing and I hear, nah, 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 nah. <laughs> and they're like, sir, you've been randomly selected. Ain't nothing random about it if every single time. Do I have the face of a criminal? Is that what it is? Because I get randomly selected every single time. And then you got to go to a little weird machine. I don't know what they're looking at, but they're just like. <laughs> <laughs> but here's the thing. TSA knows something that we don't know. All I know is I'm cutting it short. And if y'all don't let me through and do the little pat thing and let me get out of here, that I'm gonna miss my flight. What TSA knows is there are people trying to get on your flight with devices that will ensure you do not get to your destination. 
And they are saying, this may be inconvenient, this may be holding you back, this may be frustrating, but you're going to thank me in the end because you have no idea what we are saving you from. You want to get to where you're going. We want to make sure that you actually get there safely. If God is letting something die in your life, it's because he knows it will actually cause you to forfeit the promise once you get there. And you're like, man, why am I not married yet? Man, why is the business not taking off? Man, why this? Man, that? And God is saying be patient because even though it's not happening in your timing there is something that you have that is going to cause you to forfeit the miracle that she has given you do you know if you get a million dollars with the poverty mindset you ain't going to have it for long do you know that if God brings you into a room with influential people but you still have an inferiority complex you will not be in that room for long do you know that if God brings you the spouse of your dreams and friendships and relationships of your dreams, but you still have an orphan spirit on your life, that you will not have that marriage or oh, those friends for long? Hear me. Some of the greatest things that need to die is the mindsets that we had before we knew Jesus. Why? I didn't even preach none of this first service. Why did God wait a whole generation to die before they went to the promised land? Because the first generation said, there's giants in this land, and we cannot take it no matter what God said. God said, anybody who believes what they see over what I say will never be able to keep whatever I give them. I've got to let that mindset die off before they step into the promise because the righteous might live by faith, not by sight. Let it die. Second thing is this. Some things he'll ask you to kill. Some things he'll, he'll just wait. You know what's annoying about God? He lives outside of time. Because you in a rush, he's chilling. The Bible says a day in heaven is like a thousand years here on earth. He said, I ain't got nothing but time. So you let me know when you're ready for all I have for you. And until then, I'm, some things he will wait you out. Some things he'll get up in your face. No, 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 no. You don't get to wait that one out. I need you to dump that person this week. <laughs> That's a word for somebody. No, 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 no. I need you to put your two weeks this week. No, no, no. I need you to sell that house this, I need you to step away. I, so you will just hear this prompting from God. And you know how you know he's telling you to kill it? Because every time you're around it, you don't have a peace. And come on, y'all are more saved than I. You ever try to pray yourself into a peace? Yeah, like the only reason I got a piece of this job is because I'm not praying enough. So you start, you show up early, you praying over the office, you decreeing and declaring, you bring a little holy oil in your purse, and you still ain't got no peace. And God says you ain't going to have no peace because you're not supposed to be here. I've already told you to chuck the peace side. But why would God ask me to kill something? Here's why. In verse 1, it says, Now it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham, whenever God is asking you to kill something, come on now. I remember back in the day when you had those analog televisions? I think Pastor Brian actually, should they preach it last week? Showed the little screen on, the, it was last week or one of those weeks where he showed it. Oh, don't play me. That's what they said, Jesse, right? Okay, I know. I watch y'all. I see what y'all doing down here. <laughs> and it goes, this is just a... Anytime God is asking you to lay something down in your life, you need to get in your heart. This is just, I hate tests. I don't know, God bless you, man of God. I don't, I don't know if you're allowed to say this. I hate tests. I went to College University of Maryland, College Park, greatest school on planet Earth. Fear the turtle. <laughs> Ain't nothing more terrible. I don't even wonder, what's a Tar Heel? A tar <laughs> Okay, 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 okay. Oh, stop. Okay, I'm, I'm playing, I'm playing, I'm playing. Okay, push over here. Anyway. <laughs> but I remember in college, I, 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 I used to hate tests. And here's what I've learned as a pastor. Come on, come on back. Holy Ghost, back here. Okay, here we go. <laughs> here's what I've learned after I was almost was close to 15 years out of college. I love learning. I'm constantly reading. I'm constantly traveling. I love learning. I just don't like tests. 
because test is like, do you know it? And I'm like, yeah. And test says, prove it. I'm like, nah, I don't know. I don't, I don't want to prove it. I just, I know it. Prove it. And not all tests are the same. I hate tests, but my favorite test was a little Scantron that was multiple choice. I've just got to pick one of these four answers, which means I got a 25% chance of getting this question right. And if you can like rule out two of the questions, it ain't A and it ain't D. So it's either B or C. And listen, don't judge me, but I, I was super saved back in college. So I'm sitting over that scantron. I'm praying in tongues over my tongue. I said, God, guide my pencil to the right answer. <laughs> How did it work out? Let me just say this. C's get degrees, okay? And <laughs> don't clap for that. That ain't excellent. <laughs> you know what test I can't stand? And these were the professors in college that they couldn't have been Christians because the Holy Ghost would not have let them do this. It's those stupid tests that there's only five questions on the test. So you get one wrong, it's already a B. <laughs> and it would just have words and white sheet. And it would say, put your answer here. And then the most demonic phrase I've ever heard in my life, show your... So you don't just have to get the right answer. You've got to explain how you got the right. Listen, I'm lucky I got the right answer. I've got no idea how I show your work. I hate you. Anyway, God will test you. God will test you. And we, we, we ain't going to shout because I preach myself out of time. But can I just tell you the only reason God will test you is because he's getting ready to promote you. Think about it. The only reason you get a test is because you're going to another grade. They're about to hand you a diploma or a master's or a PhD, and it's your final test before you step into a new season. Hear me. If you're crying and moaning, God, why am I going through this? God, why, am I why does life seem so difficult? Why do people keep on walking out of my life? You need to remind yourself this is just a test, and every test comes with a promotion when I pass. So all I've got to do is pass, and I'm going to see the goodness of the Lord. Oh, somebody shout, this is just a test. The only reason God would ask you to kill something in your life is because he's testing you. Can I tell you the only test God gives you? Is who is your God? It's the only test. The only test is who owns you, me or your money? By the way, you know that's what tithing is, right? Tithing is a test. Every time you get paid, God is asking you one question. Who's your God? Oh, it's real quiet up in this Methodist church right now. And you know when I pay my mortgage and I say we'll figure out if I got enough to give to the church after that? What I'm saying is Bank of America or my mortgage holder is my God. When I say, you know, I got to save for this vacation and whatever I got left over, I, oh, it's quiet up in here. I'm having fun though. <laughs> what I'm saying is you died for me, but I don't trust you. And I've got to, and he's, wherever your trust is, hear me, that's your and when God said, Abraham, kill your son, what he was saying is, do you care about the promise more than the promise keeper? Are you more enamored in the miracle than the miracle maker? Has the promise of giving you become the idol of your life? And one of the things you've, 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 you've got to know, it is so much easier to preach something than it is to live it. It's easy to say, God will tell you to kill something because he wants to know, does he have your heart? It's something completely different when well, you've got to walk through that. 2015, that was my test. I'll, I'll give you the story quickly, but to speed it up, it's almost as if God told me to kill this church. Yo, I got filled with the Holy Spirit when I was 16, and that's when I knew God had called me to do this for the rest of my life. 
So from 16 to 23, I had this dream. God's called me to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. At 23 years old, my dad comes to me and said, hey, I feel from God. It's time for you to step in as a senior pastor. By the way, y'all, I was 23 years old. I was single. I'd never been to cemetery. I mean, seminary. I'm, I'm sorry, y'all. That's that Maryland education. I got to. <laughs> Come on. He's young. He's single. He's not educated. That's three strikes and you're out. There's no reason why God should use something like that. But yet God began to bless it. And 150 people came the first year, 250 in the next year, 350 in the next year, 400. Okay, I'm a lot more humble now. Back then, y'all couldn't tell me nothing. Listen, I'd be back in the green room instead of praying. I'm playing that song, I'm the man, I'm the man, I'm the man. <laughs> Is that TMI? That's TMI. Okay, okay, don't worry. God dealt with me. Year four, the church stalls out. Would not grow by one person for three years, y'all. I'd preach, I'd pray, I'd fast. Nothing happened. Anybody like me that if you see a problem, you're like, I'm here for you, kicking in doors, you're trying to find the right. I did everything I, and it would not grow. After, and you've been here, after you try everything you can, it doesn't work. You know, Donnie McClure said, After you've done all you can, you just stay. I didn't stand, I got mad. <laughs> Shut up, Uncle Donnie, I'm mad. <laughs> So then I started blaming people. And you know who I blame first? You people. I said, it's their fault. God, they don't love you. They're not inviting their friends. It's these people. They're not growing the church. And God said, it's not the people. And then I do what all of us do, but we don't say we do. I started to blame God. And I said, God, it's not fair. If I could sing like Pastor Brian, my church would be growing. <laughs> woo, 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 woo. <laughs> I need to stop messing with that, man. <laughs> no, can I be real for a second? Have you ever coveted somebody else's gift? And said, God, why didn't you give me that? Do you know coveting somebody else's gift is telling God that he messed up in making you? And I'm like, God, if you had gifted me differently, this would have grown. And God said, it's not my fault. And then I did what a lot of us do. I got mad at myself. But it wasn't like, Stephen, you're wrong. It's, Stephen, you're not good enough. Maybe this is what God called you. Maybe you're not anointed. Maybe you're, and it, it was, my, my, if my wife was here, she would tell you, he was depressed. I was not depressed. <laughs> I was just not in a great place, okay? <laughs> Same difference, right? <laughs> you wives are like, depressed. <laughs> but hear me, at the end of that three years, God came to me. And he said, Stephen, go to your pastor. My pastor had a church in D.C., big old church. He said, go to your pastor and give your church to your pastor. You ever stopped praying and started arguing? Yeah. I'm like, like but, 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 but God, but God, but this was, this, this, this was you, you gave this to me. And he said, yeah, now I'm taking it away. And when I tell you, I arrived, and I finally came to the, this was my Isaac moment, y'all. When I came to the place of what do you want? Do you want everybody to call you pastor? Or do you want to stand before Jesus one day and say that you maximize your life for the glory of God? You decide. What I didn't know at the time, and I now know looking back, is that this church was my idol. I didn't find my significance from God. I found it from the amens of people. I didn't find my significance from the fact that I'm a child of God. I found it from the fact that people say, oh, that's Pastor Stephen. And God says, as long as it owns you, I can't let you have it. Because a good thing at the wrong time will destroy you. Well, as you can tell, it didn't work. I went to the pastor. and He said, I'm not going to take it. And I went to God confused and I said, well, you told me to give it. He said, yeah. I just wanted to see if you would do it. And now that I know it's not your idol, watch me bless it. Last thing is this. Write this down. Write this down. Genesis 22, verse 1. The last thing I need you to write down is this. Death is never the end of the story. Hey, y'all, do you mind if I just talk this to you and not shout and scream and all that? We are all excited about a resurrection. But there's never a resurrection without a death. 
And God knows in order for that miracle to happen, something has to die. Pastor Brian preached it. That's why when they said Lazarus is sick, Jesus didn't come. Because he said, if I heal him when he's sick, people are going to just think that he got better. I've got to wait for him to die so that when I raise him up, people can know that there was nothing else by the hand of God. That's why when Jairus came and said, can you heal my daughter? Jesus said, no, I'm going to hang out here and deal with the woman with the issue of blood. Because once your daughter has died, when I come and raise her back to life, everybody's going to know that this was nothing other than the supernatural hand of God on our life. Here we are trying to keep everything alive in our life and God is like let it die let it die let it die because if it doesn't die then I can't resurrect it and if I can't resurrect it then nobody is going to know that you're favored that you're anointed that my promises are on your life I am the resurrection and the life and anything that dies it's not the end of the story so here it is Abraham takes his son and puts ties him up and puts him on the altar. By the way, at this point, Isaac was probably 13. Abraham was over 100 years old. There is no way somebody over 100 years old can wrestle a 13-year-old to the ground. Isaac did it willingly. That's why Romans 12, 1 says this, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercy of God, that you lay your life down as a living sacrifice. Every morning we wake up, we've got to make the decision, Stephen's dead. God's alive in me. I'm not living this day for what Stephen wants, what Stephen needs, or what's going to make Stephen look good. I'm living this life that Jesus may be glorified through me. And here's what Romans 12, 2 says. It says, then you'll be able to prove the will of God, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Oh, there's levels to this. There's levels to your walk with God. Can I give you the most elementary level? Being a Christian. You know what being a Christian means? It means when you die, you go to heaven. You know how many people when they die are going to heaven, but they're living in hell right now? I'm going to heaven, but I'm depressed. I'm going to heaven, but I'm broke. I'm going to heaven, but I'm overwhelmed. I'm going to heaven, and my relationships are in shambles here on earth. Jesus did not die on the cross for you to live in hell and die to go to heaven. That's not even the gospel. The gospel is thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it already is. I'm not waiting for heaven to have God's joy. I can have it in the midst of my storm. I'm not waiting for heaven to have God's peace because he sends a peace that surpasses all understanding that will guard my mind and guard my heart in Christ Jesus. Justin, stop preaching. We got to end this message. Abraham has the knife up. He's getting ready to kill his son. And God says, Abram, Abram, calls him twice. And he says, stop. He said, today you have proven to me that you fear the Lord. And he says, because you've obeyed me, I will make your son into a great nation. God never promised Abraham a son. He always promised him a nation. Abraham only wanted a son. And God said, you're dreaming too small. I, 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 I always get, I'm not going to lie to you, really insecure when it comes to stuff like vision for the church. Because I'm supposed to be God's man of power for the hour. Everybody's like, Pastor, what do you see 10 years from now for Union Church? And we'll be like, guys, I didn't see this. This isn't not like I saw it 25 years ago and I knew God was going to do it. And I'm walking in the fullness of my dreams. Y'all, I wanted to have a church of 1,000 people by the time I was 65 years old. And that is as big as I could dream. 
You're talking about a church with over 10,000 people in three different states with six different campuses, overflow at every single service, people getting saved, delivered, filled with the Holy Ghost, baptized in the Holy Ghost, people who were divorced getting remarried, people who battled suicide and depression, walking in freedom. Only God could come up with something like this. And I can tell you, not from the word, but from my experience, that whatever you are dreaming, it is minuscule compared to what God wants to do through your life. If you would make him your God and lay down your idol, watch him take that dream and blow it up bigger than you could ever ask, think, or imagine. Father God, we are grateful. We are thankful that your ways are higher than our ways, that your thoughts are higher than our thoughts. And God, in this moment, we come with a fresh surrender. We say it's not our life. It's your life. Have your way. Right where you're sitting with your eyes closed and your head back, can you pray this prayer with me? Say, Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me? I just give God a moment to make this time, to make this message personal to you. Some of you need to stop complaining about the test that you're in and start praising because you know you're on the verge of promotion. Some of y'all need to stop holding on to something that God has said, let it go. Some of you, if you would be honest, you would say, what God has asked me to lay down is my life. Because you know it's not God who calls the shots in your life. You do. So before I close, I want to ask you this. Where are you with Jesus? And I'm not asking you, do you go to church? I'm not asking you, do you believe in God? Because you could believe in God and not be a Christian. What I'm asking is, have you ever surrendered to Jesus? Have you ever made him the Lord of your life? Because that's where living begins. So wherever you find yourself, watching online in the room in overflow, if you just sense tugging on your heart right now, I need Jesus in my life. You can make that decision right now. I'm not going to have you stand up or walk the altars. We don't do that here at Union Church. But right where you are, can you pray this prayer with me? Say, Lord Jesus, today I'm ready. I surrender. I give you all of me. I believe that you died on the cross. You shed your blood so that all of my sin, all of my mistakes can be erased. And today, I make you my Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And